want to thank the organizers because I had started to give up hope on Netherlands. You know, the 80s used to be so vibrant, my first ever soil conference that I attended was in Amsterdam. Inspiring, exciting, Jose Lutzenberg, who became the environment minister of Brazil, was there. And uh, the, pr the earlier organization, out of which etc. was born, it used to be called RAFI, the Rural Advancement Fund International. Um, and then kind of the ecology movement went into hibernation a little bit, at least for those of us who live far away. So I want to thank all of you. I want to thank the organizers. And it's wonderful to see, the, to see the number of people and organizations which have come together for this. So why do we need another food system and another agriculture system? Because this one was never meant to be. Every tool of the current system was designed for war. It should never have entered our food system. Pesticides were designed for the concentration camps, the early generation. Then they were designed for biological warfare and chemical warfare. It's only when industry that should have wrapped up after the war decided Oh, let's just make nice ads. DDT is good for me, and it jingles on everything. And if you look at the ads of the period when the war was ending, of how an industry that had got used to war profits was now transforming itself into an agrochemical industry. The synthetic fertilizers were made in the explosive factories. And that's why next time you read about a terrorism attack, it could be Afghanistan, it could be India, it could be Oklahoma, there'll be a little line that says fertilizer bomb. Remember the Oslo boy who was buying up fertilizer and then blew it all up at the offices and then shot people at the island? These are weapons of war. And they're also toxic and poisonous. So the first reason we need another food system is we need a food system without poisons. And this morning, Pablo showed so clearly the ads on DDT and how the same scientist who had promoted DDT then had to admit the harms. Except now they're unleashing 6,000 untested chemicals every year. And at that time, they didn't control governments. They did not control research in universities. They did not control the media. So we can't afford the continuation of these toxics. Just another reason why we need another food system is an agriculture des system designed for inputs that came from war can only function as a monoculture. If all I'm thinking about is the nitrogen and, and phosphorus and potassium, that's called the NPK mentality, then I will only grow crops that can deal with those fixed doses. Whereas if I am growing a corn and a bean, as was shown in the slides earlier, uh, then the bean, uh, bean is fixing nitrogen for me, and the two can grow together. As soon as you apply synthetic fertilizers, plants start to compete. We have a wonderful mixture of um, the pigeon pea, I think Pablo showed the pigeon pea, the turdal, and it goes quite tall. And, um, and ragi, which is a millet. Now, these two have been growing as companions for millennia. The ragi gives you the calcium and the iron and the fiber, and the turdal 
uh, gives the soil the nitrogen, but it gives you the protein. And when I was doing seed collections, I went to every campus that I could visit. And uh, the agriculture campus of, uh, of Karnataka Agriculture University, they said, we're having such a difficult time having a companionship between these two crops. And they showed me about 60 plots where either one or the other became dominant. And I just asked them, are you fertilizing organically or synthetically? They said, no, no, with synthetic nitrogen. And of course, either one crop would do well and the other wouldn't, or the other would do well. And the second one wouldn't. And they just couldn't get it right because they weren't allowing the cooperation in the soil and the cooperation between the plants and the intelligence in each of these living systems to play its role. Every living system is a self-organized system. That's what makes living systems living. They're self-organized. And when anything is self-organized, it's based on cooperation. Like the amazing people who cooked your dinner, 800 people. That needs huge cooperation. Any system that is externally organized must become competitive. And that applies to external input systems in agriculture and it applies to external input systems in society. Where we stop defining ourselves as who we are, what we want, what we love to do and what gives us joy to Universities seem to be churning out only people with a biotechnology degree. It's BT, IT, MBA. Biology has been shrunk to biotechnology. Knowledge has been shrunk to information technology. And organizing has been shrunk to business management. And I don't think the world needs only those three skills. It needs much more. It definitely needs skills on how to take care of this planet, a skill that is not provided by industrial agriculture. So all that industrial agriculture has done is destroy nature's gifts of soil and biodiversity, water, even the air and the climate. I've grown up in, in India where anywhere, even in the desert, water was at 10 feet. The Green revolution requires not just the external inputs and monoculture, but it's very water intensive. In Punjab, 90% water is used for irrigation. Globally, 75%. And what comes out is polluted water, full of nitrates that's creating dead zones in rivers, water bodies, and oceans. Those monocultures, based on toxics, are destroying biodiversity both by displacing crops and their varieties and species. We used to eat 8,500 species of plants as human beings. In India, before the Green Revolution, we had 200,000 varieties of rice. 1,500 varieties of mangoes, beans. I remember Howard did collections of wheat and he took, a, I think, 1,500 varieties of wheat to what became the Cambridge Seed Bank, which was then privatized to Lever, which was then privatized to Monsanto. That's where picked it, they picked up the gluten-free wheat and then patented it, and we had to fight that patent case came from the Indian collections. In 1995, the FAO organized the Plant Genetic Resources Conference in Leipzig, and the assessment then was 75% biodiversity has disappeared in agriculture because of chemical monocultures and the introduction of varieties designed just for chemical response. My guess is it's by now 90% because at that time, Argentina hadn't been destroyed, Brazilian Amazon hadn't been chopped down large scale for soil cultivation. Uh, the Midwest of US wasn't a monoculture of GM soya and GM corn. So my guess is about 90% crop biodiversity is gone. 
And those chemical sprays, sprays destroy more. The 75% disappearance of bees in the colony collapse disorder. But not just of the bees. Um, we did a study on the BT cotton areas. And in four years of planting, 22% of beneficial soil organisms had been killed by the release of the toxin. There's new work that's showing that the spraying of Roundup for Roundup ready crops is killing the milkweed, which supports the monarch butterfly. And there were Cornell studies that shows that pollen of Bt corn kills monarch butterfly larvae. So it's not a surprise that 75% of the monarch butterflies have gone. Their migration to Mexico, the area where they used to come and to be just one field of color has shrunk dramatically. Animals, it's the same. Trees, of course, don't exist in industrial agriculture. In Punjab, you don't see trees because with chemicals and large-scale monocultures comes mechanization. And every perennial which we need as hedgerows, as field buns, is seen as an interference for the tractor. So any large-scale industrial mechanized farming system is a desert in every meaningful way. Living soils have millions and billions of soil organisms that are creating our soil fertility. Darwin's real book is the one he wrote on earthworms. And he says by the time the history of evolution is written, we will realize no other species has done so much for this planet as the earthworm, which creates soil fertility, turns our soils into dams, where water can be stored. It's doing the work of a tractor, a dam, and a fertilizer factory all at the same time. All we're doing is dumping urea, killing it. Just do the experiment. Take the urea salt, sprinkle it on a little earthworm, and you see how it starts to die. Of course, I never let it fully die. When we were young and we'd trek in the mountains and we'd get bitten by leeches, we always carry salt. Because that's the only way you can get the leech off you. Well, all of these synthetic fertilizers are salts. And we haven't even, we do these tests in our lab where chemical soils and organic soils are compared. Our farmers bring their soils and then they come back two, three years in a row to see how the health of the soil is improving. But my assessment is 75% of the soils of the world have been deprived of their organic matter, their living humus, their soil organisms. They've been compacted. And of course, because they're not being able to aggregate, it's leading to soil erosion, which is why we have a treaty on land degradation and desertification, because it's such a serious problem. And I did a book called Soil Not Oil because in uh, the lead up to, uh, to the Copenhagen summit, agriculture was not even on the horizon in a serious way in the climate discussions. So I sat and did all the calculations on the basis of the IPCC assessments. And if you add all the figures, the overall contribution of industrial agriculture and globalized trade in industrial agriculture, is contributing 40% of the greenhouse gases. That, of course, includes the carbon dioxide emissions from mechanization, long distance transport, all the food miles, but it also includes the nitrogen oxides that come from synthetic fertilizer. And nitrogen oxide is three times, 300 times more destabilizing for the climate and the methane from all the factory farms. So, industrial agriculture is 75% of the ecological devastation on the planet. And in spite of destroying 75% of the living systems and the ecosystems, the myth 
is spread that without industrial farming, the world can't be fed. The figures are now being repeated daily. That 70% of the food in the world is being produced today, 2013. Not a century ago, not 50 cent years ago, but today, 2013, yeah, 2014. 70% comes from small farms. And the reason the UN had to declare this year, the year of the family farm, was because of this figure. That the mainstay of food security is small farms and gardens, urban gardens. 30% is coming from industrial agriculture. And yet that 30% is destroying 75% destroying of the planet. So just extrapolate. If that system was allowed to spread to destroy the remaining 25%, will we get more food or zero food? A destroyed planet will give no food at all. Dead souls, disappearing waters, a totally chaotic climate, no seeds. It's a recipe for an absolute not just disaster, it's a recipe for human extinction. And it's, how, how long is it? In the Green Revolution was brought to India in seven, 1965. So we're talking about 50 years. In 50 years, 75% of the planet has been destroyed. It, it'll take them just 10 years to wipe out the rest. And a lot of other species will go, but the human species will surely get wrapped up. And the reason we need another system is I think we should try and survive into the future as a species. No species has deliberately designed its extinction. <laughs> but through industrial agriculture, we are. It's in the design of the industrial agriculture system. It's in its design because of the first fact of it destroying the base of farming, ecological systems. It's in the design because it's actually not a very productive and efficient use of natural resources. Just run through a few figures. It's supposed to be more productive, but it uses 10 units of energy to produce one unit of food. Whereas ecological systems use one unit of food to produce two units of food. Or take the fact, I mean, how did I get into this? I got into this because in 1984, we had had two mega disasters in India. One was the disaster of Bhopal where a pesticide plant owned then by Union Carbide, now by Dow Chemicals, leaked. It leaked in the middle of the night of December the 2nd. Cold night, with a very low inversion layer, so the gas just moved through the colonies and settlements, killing people. 3,000 were killed immediately. 30,000 have been killed since then. Hundreds of thousands are being born crippled. I was in Bhopal last year, and it was a hall full like this, of the children who've been born. So the disaster isn't over. But the disaster isn't also over because just last week, Dow, which should be compensating for the damages, has sued the survivors for continuing the struggle. Well, that same year, we had the rise of extremism in Punjab, where the land, which is the land of the Green Revolution. And the Green Revolution had been given a Nobel Peace Prize. But in Punjab, 30,000 people had been killed. And, uh, you know, I was busy with quantum theory. For my doctoral work, I mean, I had no idea what's going on with the Green Revolution. But I decided in 84 to study it, and I was doing a major consultancy for the United Nations University on peace and global transformation and natural resource conflicts. So I just said, I think there's something here. 
because there were conflicts over rivers, farmers were protesting, but the government sent the military. And the military was sent to the most sacred shrine of the Sikhs, the Golden Temple, <coughs> as a result of which Indira Gandhi, our prime minister of that time, was assassinated by her security, who were Sikhs, and the next day, 3,000 people, Sikhs were killed, you know, in a program designed for violence. And the issue has not died, the issue of, uh, of the injustice to the Sikhs hasn't died. So I just decided, I, you know, I started to go to Punjab, read every little text, every book on plant breeding, every book on irrigation, every book on pest control, um, everything on the soils. Found out that the half, within 10 years, half the soils of Punjab were diseased and dying. 10% were dead, salinated and waterlogged deserts. I wrote a book called The Violence of the Green Revolution and decided then to commit my life to a non-violent agriculture. But I realized in the process that actually we've always been told the Green Revolution took India from a um, famine condition to surplus. No, we didn't have a famine in 65. I was old enough to know I was in school. We had a rise in price because we had a drought. And the US wouldn't send us wheat. They said, got to change your agriculture, introduce the chemicals. I won't go into the details of what went on at that time. For those of you who want to know, you can read the violence of the Green Revolution. But I would look at the fields of Punjab, and I know farming from my region and other parts of the country, and I could just see with my eyes, these are impoverished fields. And then I started to do the scientific studies. And every time you look, a monoculture, no matter how intensive it be, will always produce less than a mixed cultivation, a biodiverse farm, and what I call biodiversity and ecological intensification. And the figures are very, very dramatic. For, the, for Punjab, let me just see if I can quickly find these figures. We've always been told, oh, the ra you know, food increased. What's never talked about is that the production of other crops went down. The millets are as good as zero, pulses have disappeared, all seeds have gone. Basic foods that are vital to a balanced nutrition aren't produced anymore. So we have those mountains and the 21 million tents that are rotting because food has stopped being food. When I took my Chipko sisters, Chipko was the movement where women came out to protect the Himalayan forests and I became a volunteer in the movement and the women would say, you, you'll have to kill us before you kill the tree, when you hug the tree. And I had to take them to Chandigarh for some reason and uh, they're looking at these giant storehouses and they're saying, what's that? And I said, wheat, and rice. They said, how can it be? Why are they insulting food like this? Because food can only be cared for on a small scale. Food can only be cared for in decentralized systems. And the centralization of production and with that centralization, the centralization of distribution, by its very necessity means waste. You don't have waste. There is no waste in living systems. There's no waste in ecological farming systems. There's no waste in local food systems. I grow many crops. All of them I use, some for the soil, some for the cow. I say in India, nothing gets wasted. The cow's always waiting. <laughs> or the earthworms are waiting. It only becomes waste when Aid sent long distance and stored in centralized systems, as in the Punjab store houses, or it's taken by Walmart. And first Walmart will say, no, throw away half because the apples aren't exactly the right size. A South African told me that overnight they had to change the, the trees 
of the this variety of the apple because Walmart changed the size of the truck. <laughs> and of course, as you know, the you know that famous tomato that never made it to the market, the flavor saver, was designed for transport, not for eating. As so much food is now. Breeding today is for trucks, not for human beings. How long can it sit on a truck? And then it has to be the identical size. That's why they didn't like the round tomatoes and Berkeley had a whole research project on square tomatoes. Again, for packaging and transport. I've been told, I read in the Indian newspapers that Wageningen is working on solving the food problem. They've brought the soil or whatever material exists in Mars and they're actually planning to grow food on Mars. They've got a research project in this university. <laughs> and our research systems are brilliant at doing what doesn't need to be done and not doing what needs to be done. Because the movement of Navdanya that I started conserves biodiversity and seed, we intensify biodiversity. We ask farmers to grow as much variety as they can on the farm and then eat as much variety as they can. So when people tell me organic is too costly, I say not for the farmer who grew it. And they are the first. They have the first right to organic food. Having done the biodiversity conservation and biodiversity intensification, we decided to start to measure not the monoculture output, which is a yield, the yield per acre, which is repeatedly talked about. The yield is of a single commodity. And the yield is that which leaves the farm. So the grain or wheat is measured as yield, but not the straw that should stay on the farm. The corn is measured as yield, but not the straw of corn. So what should get recycled to the farm is treated as waste and isn't allowed to return to the soil. In Punjab, this package has meant that the monoculture is then harvested by combined harvesters. And as you know, combined harvesters leave a huge stock, which they then have to burn. And if any of you have tried to come to Delhi in winter and you can't land because of the smog, that's part of the contribution. So when we did the biodiversity productivity analysis, hands down, a biodiverse farm produces more. Pablo also showed a figure with the maize and the, and the pigeon pea uh, combination across the board. And what we found is the more the biodiversity, the more the productivity, and for the farmer, the more the profits. First, because the farmer is not in distress. Second, because the farmer has resilience. I mean, we've had drought in 2009, flooding like you couldn't believe last year. We lost 20,000 people in our region because of a climate disaster, something that never made it to the international news. But if you have a diverse crop, something or the other thrives. It doesn't get wiped out. You've got one crop with one external input and that perfect requirement of water, you get too little rain, too much rain, it's zero output. Then we said what matters is not the kilograms of what you're eating, but what's in it, the nutrition. And our food has been systematically denutrified because of the application of just nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. No other micronutrients and trace elements are going into the soil. Our plants are deprived. Our food is deprived and therefore we are deprived. And this is just US and, U and UK data uh, in the last 60 years. The decline in calcium content, 29% in US. 19% in Britain. Magnesium, 21%, 35%.
potassium 6 and 14, phosphorus 11 and 6, iron 32 and 22. Zinc they weren't even looking at at that time, but I meet more and more doctors who tell me zinc deficiency has become the single biggest problem for mental problems. I met a doctor who said 50% of the young people in Australia are depressed. And when they do, the brain chemistry they're finding, zinc deficiency. We didn't even imagine soils need zinc, plants need zinc, we need zinc. So we started to measure health per acre which is nutrition per acre. And I won't run through the figures of the different farms because it could take me all night. But a system has been designed to wipe out nutrition. First by wiping out biodiversity, then by depleting the soil of their nutrients and the plants of their nutrients and our food of its nutrients. And the focus is yield, yield, yield of single commodities. So of course there have to be deficiencies. If there are no greens in the field, which, because fields are now sprayed by Roundup, which kills everything green it comes in contact with, children will have vitamin A deficiency. The solution is grow the greens again. 20,000 units compared to the 350 in the golden rice. And I know there's a fellow who pretends to have been working in Greenpeace in Canada. I got a letter from Greenpeace Canada that he was kicked out because he was a lobbyist for the nuclear energy industry, for the GMO industry, for the tar sands, everything negative. He always was standing in defense of it. And he's pretending he's an ecologist, has to come and wake up the Europeans because you are involved in a crime against humanity by not wanting GMOs. It was a golden rice tour. I'd, I'd done an essay long ago, 2000, when they first started talking about it, because we know the different foods that can provide 100 times more vitamin A. And not just vitamin A, the zinc, the magnesium, the iron, and everything else we need. This last year, because it's all about, oh, that child who's going blind and that woman in India who's dying because of iron deficiency. Now they come up with a GMO banana. <laughs> and you would wonder, okay, does banana have iron? It's got very good potassium. It's very good for when you have loosies. But it's not the best source for iron. It has only 0.44 milligrams. The turmeric we use in our Indian food, 67. Compared to 0 0.44, 67. The neem, 25. Buckwheat is 15. Um, the beautiful tree, Moringa, which is rich in vitamin A and rich in iron, 28.26. Rice bran, 35. There's no dearth of iron. If we allow diversity to flourish on our farms and in our kitchen. But the monoculture of the mind, as I have called it, can only think in terms of the four or five commodities on which they can make profits. The reason we are seeing such an expansion of GMO corn and GMO soya is because with it are collected, uh, connected royalties. It's not that farmers of Argentina said, give us GM soya. In fact, the farmers of Brazil have sued Monsanto, $2.2 billion for unjustified royalty collection. Monsanto was collecting royalties on farm saved seed. So another reason why we need another food system is we can't afford this blindness to the gift of abundance that nature gives us, the gift of biodiversity. 
It has already cost us too much. We now need to work with biodiversity to produce more food and nutrition while using up less of the Earth's resources. A smaller footprint and a higher output. The current system has a huge footprint with a negative output. There is another big reason why we need to move to another food system. And that has to do with science and knowledge. For me as a scientist, if I have to look at an agriculture system, the first thing I want to study is how the soil and the plants and the animals and the human community relate to each other. What are the connections? That knowledge of connectedness is ecology. It's a science of relationship. And that's why agroecology, without anyone being paid to say agroecology, everyone is talking agroecology. It's a movement that's grown without a lobbyist. Just two areas of how the industrial system deals with soil fertility. It has no idea what's in the soil. It's got no idea what the soil organisms do. All it knows is, oh, I could make synthetic fertilizers, synthetic nitrogen in explosive factories. Let me now use them somehow or the other without knowing what it does to the living system, which gives you the real fertility. So I call it a science of ignorance. Industrial fertilization is a science of ignorance. In relationship to the living soil, it has zero knowledge. Its science is a chemical knowledge about how to create a chemical. Initially for the war and now for the farm. Similarly, if I want to understand how pests are controlled, I would do what Albert Howard did. Uh, so Albert Howard was sent to India as the imperial um, economic botanist, 1905, by the British Empire. And he arrives and says there were no pests in the fields. So I threw away my spray guns and turned the pests and the peasant into my professors. And having studied from them, I then understood that the emergence of a pest is already a sign of a failed agricultural system. Because a healthy system should have no pests. It will have insects. But because of the balance, no one insect will become a pest. Just as no one organism will become a disease. But what is pest control? in the industrial system. You made some chemicals for the war. You said, now let's find a way to spray them on bugs. You don't know what it does to other species. You've got no idea what it's doing to human beings. Again, it's ignorance of the relationship between pests and predators. The science is a chemistry of producing persons. That's the science. It's not a science of the ecology of pest control. So we've got very violent tools from another science applied to the wrong domain with ignorance about how the full system works. The biotech industry gets mad when I say the reason Genetic engineering is not such a good idea, is because it's just a stupid way to do things. It's a stupid way to get iron in your food, to do it through GMO bananas. Stupid way to get vitamin A through golden rice. It's stupid to try and control pests by putting toxic genes into plants through Bt toxins. Even more stupid to try and control weeds through herbicide resistance. Already, just in 15 years, half the farms of the United States are overtaken by super weeds. Half. 17 million hectares. So what are they doing now? They're breeding, not breeding, they're engineering genes into corn with resistance to an ingredient of Agent Orange 2,4-D. And Dow, 
is a big player again. The lobbies have worked with the European Commission to push through the Pioneer 1507, just recently. Pioneer 1507 has been jointly developed by DuPont and Dow. Dow, if you might remember, is the same company responsible for continuing injustice in Bhopal. I went last year to Hawaii, and the movement there is so strong, is so strong in terms of trying to become GMO-free, even though Monsanto has all its seed production on the island of Kauai. They managed to get some laws passed, labeling laws, laws to be informed about what is in the sprays, the chemical sprays that are put on the seat. Dow is suing the local government that passed a bill for the right to know. They're going to kill you and you won't know how we killed you. So the genocidal aspects of the system are a very strong reason. Ecocide and genocide jointly. We witnessed the genocide through pushing farmers into debt. I was very privileged to have been invited to a meeting in 1987 where the industry laid out very clearly. First, that the reason they were doing genetic engineering was in order to take patents. They weren't interested in genetic engineering. They were interested in the patents. But they could, by saying, I've added a new gene, call it a novel crop, and then claim they were the creators and makers and owners, and therefore they should collect royalties. And Monsanto's on record saying that they wrote the intellectual property rights agreement of the Free Trade Treaty, uh, GATT, which became WTO, Article 27.3b. Monsanto said we were the patient, diagnostician, physician, all in one. We defined a problem. The problem they defined was farmers save seeds. The solution they offered was it should now be a crime. When I heard these industries talk about five companies controlling our food and health system through patents, that's the day I decided I would save seeds and not recognize patents. Because life is not created by a Monsanto. Life is created by life. And the evolution of biodiversity is a gift we've received from nature and our ancestors. It wasn't invented the day a toxic gene was put into it. In fact, that should be counted as pollution in terms of the biological integrity of that particular species. And I took a pledge that no matter how long it takes me, I will not accept GMOs, and I will not accept patents on seed. And GMOs, in fact, translate into God move over, we are the creators now onwards. <laughs> so one side is the control, the other side is the harm. In terms of biotechnology, a lot of discussion has been around safety. And we're repeatedly told every research says it's safe. Some research, neutral research, independent research, found how. Arpad Putsai was the first commissioned by the UK government to study GMO potatoes, 98. He didn't expect to find what he did. Reduced brains, expanded pancreas, a compromised immunity system, and total damage to the intestinal system. So he went to his director. They held a press conference. They said, if this has happened in three months of feeding, what's going to happen to human beings eating this all their lives? For two hours, BBC covered this issue, and then silence. Blair made sure Arpad's lab was shut. Arpad had moved to England after the war, as he says, to find freedom. He's gone back to Hungary to find freedom. More recently, Seralini, one of the top scientists of France, decided to do a two-year study because he was a regulator. And he found the studies that the industry was doing were very, very sloppy. He says, I should know 
I should really find out what is happening. And he did this very famous study in the Food and Chemical Toxicology Journal, and it was screened uh, this morning. There's an attempt to have it withdrawn. The journal says, no, this has been peer-reviewed. Re we can't. It's, be, it's gone through every scientific assessment. So Monsanto just changes an editor, Woodman, who says, now I retract. I retract the study. I call this knowledge terrorism. And it's a serious threat to independent science and independent research. Very serious threat. In terms of the costs of monopoly, we witness what it does in India. Globalization allowed companies like Monsanto into India in 95. In no time, they had started to lock Indian companies into joint ventures and licensing arrangements. Very fast, 95% of the cotton seed was a GMO cotton seed. I won't give you the story of how I sued Monsanto for its illegal entry and they couldn't introduce it right away. Um, but the main thing is they started to take over the seed market. 8,000% jump in the seed price. Something that was available on the farm now has to be bought at 8,000%. It doesn't really work to control pests. And we have a whole report, it's available on our, uh, on our website. I couldn't find a better title for it than the GMO emperor has no clothes. <laughs> because three claims it produces more, reduces chemical use, and is eff efficient at controlling pests and weed. None of it is true. And globally, that is showing up. So very rapidly, our farmers started to get into debt. But it was a different kind of debt. The earlier debt was with banks, with public banks, where they could stand and protest, won't give back the debt, won't give back the debt. Now it was with the agents of the seed company. And normally, what they, do the agents make them sign? Oh, you'll make so much money, you'll be a millionaire. Just sign a paper, mortgage your land. And the farmer couldn't even imagine that for cotton he would lose because cotton is a cash crop. Farmers started to commit suicide. The figure from 95 to today is 284,000. More than a quarter million Indian farmers. Most of them in the cotton belt. Most cotton is now GMO cotton. Now, because in large parts of the world, and in India, we stopped the next crop, the BT egg plant, and most parts of the world, people have accepted GMOs. And therefore, this dream of collecting a trillion dollars royalty annually from seed sales hasn't worked, but that dream is still there. And that is why Europe got the seed law. Because if you can't push GMO straight, then make local seeds illegal so that people are forced to buy seeds. First it'll be hybrids, then it'll be GMO. But it's about royalty collection. And I'm very happy, you know, I worked very closely with the parliamentarians and the movements worked very closely with each other and both the Environment Committee and the Agriculture Committee sent back that draft. It should never return. Because seed is good only if it's diverse. Seed is good only if it evolves and has resilience. Seed is good only if it has quality and taste and nutrition. Uniformity is a wrong measure or biodiversity. Centralization is a wrong management system for seeds which can only grow according to the soil, the climate. How can Norway, an island in Greece, be imposed with the same standard by one agency in Brussels? Monopolies, centralization, monocultures go hand in hand, and they are the instruments of power. We have to create instruments of democracy, diversity, resilience. And the final reason why we have to replace the old system is because this old system, which really can't last more than another five to ten years, but in those five to ten years, it can only survive by establishing a totalitarian rule. 
a totalitarianism on our farms, where farmers cannot grow what they want in the way they want it. They're locked into a state slavery. Pablo had those slides on slavery and someone asked, are you suggesting a parallel? I suggest a parallel. When I started to fight for seed freedom, it's because I saw a parallel. That time, it was blacks who were captured in Africa and taken to work on the cotton fields of America and the sugarcane fields. Today, it is all of life being enslaved. All of life, all species. We've never had an imperialism across the planet. Never. And of course, the farmers who are committing suicide in Vidharma are feeling enslaved, are feeling trapped, and find the suicide as the only way out. It's a totalitarian system because of the way knowledge is being managed. Science has been replaced by propaganda. How much newspaper space you can buy is what decides what will be called science, not how much knowledge you generated. And it is a totalitarian structure, even at the level of safety. I find it very strange that a cucumber with its own personality is seen as a threat to health. And phytosanitary measures mean a straight cucumber, a tomato of that size, an apple of that size. The sanitary and phytosanitary measures are actually pseudo-hygiene measures to destroy local food systems. I call them pseudo-hygiene. And I, in fact, led a satyagra, the fight for truth, when they tried to ban our mustard oil, saying mustard oil is dangerous because it's made on a virgin oil mill. GMO soya oil is wonderful for you. They tried to change India's laws. And the women of the slums are the ones who called me, said, bring our mustard back. I said, I'll bring your mustard back. And we did a non-cooperation against the laws that were banning our mustard. Or, and all edible oils made in artisanal ways. So today we still have mustard. And that law is still on paper. Just as the seed law that was attempted in India was uh, in 2004. A law like your European seed law was being brought for compulsory registration. That's how they do it. You know? If you have a car, you have to register. It makes sense. But I have a seed from my great-grandmother, and I have to go to Brussels to say, may I please grow this? <laughs> that compulsory registration is a totalitarian instrument. If a family has been making cheese forever, and suddenly know your stainless steel isn't right, I just watched the most amazing oak caskets in a winery in Florence being thrown to disuse, right? You can't use oak anymore, you've got to use stainless steel. These are industrial mechanisms to impose industrial production, whether it is at the farm in terms of food production or in processing. Now, what we are seeing is a very deep vertical integration of the food system. Five companies controlling seed, five controlling grain trade, five processors, five retailers. That's what we are talking about. 20 companies. All integrated one to the other. And if you notice in California when they wanted to have labeling laws, it wasn't just Monsanto who resisted. Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola poured money into it because they, they used the high fructose corn syrup from the GM corn. So they're one. And they're one in terms of force feeding bad food to the people. We know the harms that junk food has created, the whole obesity issue that was mentioned earlier. And from the analysis I've done over the years, this in vertical integration system with a combination of a Pepsi and a Walmart and a Cargill and, and Monsanto brings 1% to the farmer, 1% of the consumer, euro, dollar, rupee. It also only because it brings only 1%, it throws people off the land. It makes agriculture unviable because of injustice. And then only 1% people are on the land, and 1% return is coming. And the rest is going in terms of corporate agribusiness profits. No wonder they want to get into food. 
what we need is a 50% model. 50% should go back to the farmer and the local economy, 50%. And we do it in Navdanya. It's not that impossible. And if 50% return comes to the farmer, 50% people will be on the land. In any case, 50% are in the food system, except they're in the necroeconomy part of it. The necroeconomy is the economy of death. So they're making the pesticides, they're spraying the pesticides, they're driving the trucks, they're emitting the carbon dioxide, all the jobs that are killing the planet. You add it up, it's still 50%. We could have 50% in creative work. Creative work with the soil, creative work with the food. I know how excited young people are when they relate directly to food. Yesterday I was served the most amazing dinner before coming here a young woman who gave up a marketing managing job and she does raw foods. Delicious. If we would only unleash the energies of the young people to take care of the soil and the seed, to take care of the jobs of, of, uh, of our food and create work out of that. In any case, we are seeing an end to work. 50% of southern Europe's youth are unemployed today in Greece, in Rome, in Spain. I work with them and I work with the governments. In Rome, the government is handing over land to create employment and grow food. I have seen people thrown out of software companies moving abroad, now growing organic tomatoes. And they're happy. They're saying we don't make that kind of money. But at least we're happy. And that's why at, at Navdanya I've started the Earth University to basically have a place where the whole food system can be learned about through both the mind, but nature as teacher, farmers as teachers, your own learning as teachers. And now every September, because of the demand of young people from around the world, we've started offering a course on the A to Z of agroecology and organic food systems. I hope some of you will come, but whether you come or not, food is the place, seed is the place where we have to reclaim our democracy and rescue the totalitarianism that is being put in place. It'll happen bit by bit. And before we know it, we won't be able to make changes. We have a short window of time to reclaim both our bread and our freedom. Otherwise, we'll have neither bread nor freedom.